We're now going to discuss host responses to the parasite that results in the production of protection. What we see here is a, a schematic of data collected from around the world, which summarizes the um, effects of maternal antibody, shown as IgG in green here, on the uh, susceptibility of the newborn to infection, and of course, uh, its rate of mortality associated with the level of maternal antibody. And as you can see, for the first six or eight months, the, f the newborn is protected against infection, even though it's living in the middle of an uh, endemic center, usually. These data were derived from those regions throughout the world. But once the newborn reaches about eight months, and the uh, maternal antibodies have uh, decreased in concentration in the newborn's serum as the result of the decay of IgG over time, the newborn now becomes susceptible to not only infection, but the mortality of that infection because its own immune system hasn't quite matured enough to allow it to fend for itself, so to speak. So we see that most of the deaths from malaria in the less developed world occur between the ages of eight months and five years. Now, as the child matures and develops a strong immune response to the parasites, because they're now exposed to them on a yearly basis during the transmission zone, in some cases, they're always exposed to the parasite because there's constant transmission. In some places, there is intermittent transmission. And in other places, there is seasonal transmission. So we have these three different modes to discuss in terms of the epidemiology. But, but people who live constantly exposed to the parasites and survive past the age of five are likely to survive until they're 90, at least uh, with respect to the mortality that this parasite induces. And that's because of the immune stimulation given by one single stage of this infection, namely the sporozoite. And it's been determined that at least for Plasmodium falciparum, the antigenic motif for the sporozoite antigen is asparagine, alanine, asparagine, and proline. Those four amino acids are repeated many times within the B cell stimulating zone of the antigen that lies on the surface of the sporozoite. It also contains a glycolipid anchor, and it also has another region that's, um, that varies with regards to the strains of parasite, but mostly the middle part, the B cell stimulating part of the sporozoite antigen remains constant, at least for the species of uh, Plasmodium falciparum. Investigations have um, been done to, to mutate that middle region, that uh, NANP region, to see actually what it does for the parasite, because uh, it obviously must have a function. And it turns out that uh, when you mutate this region and then try a natural infection using uh, um, sporozoites that contain that, uh, that different motif, that they're unable to complete the life cycle in the mosquito. And uh, as a result, even though they can go on to reproduce inside of a mammalian host, once they're taken up by the mosquito, that they do not result in the production of, of sporozoites. So they obviously have some role in the maturation of sporozoites inside the definitive host. But if we respond to those antigens, like I just mentioned, uh, then protection does result, and uh, we can prove that it's protection specific to antibodies and not some other cellular process. There are other antigenic stimulations that the parasite gives to the host through merozoites, for instance, and through uh, the uh, sexual, the presexual stages, the gametocytes. And some really interesting vaccine candidates have been identified uh, from those stages of the parasite as well. Unfortunately, none of them are uh, applicable to a modern vaccine for this uh, disease. To diagnose malaria, uh, in the old days, before we had molecular technologies to help us, uh, we simply took a drop of blood from a patient, spread it out on a slide to make a thin smear, 
and we took another drop of blood and allowed it to uh, coagulate in situ, right on the spot. So we had two different ways of looking. We had a, a thick spot of blood and a thin smear of blood. We then stained both the thick and the thin portions of this material, and underneath the microscope, as we saw in the beginning, the morphology of each species is, is unique, and we can tell whether the patient was infected with Plasmodium falciparum by finding these uniquely shaped uh, gametocytes, or we can find the enlarged red cells associated with Plasmodium vivax, or we can find the band forms uh, only associated with Plasmodium malariae. So in those three major species throughout the world, we can make a very positive identification simply on morphology. Uh, it's a little more problematic when we come to looking at Plasmodium nolzi. However, uh, it's only found in certain places and usually not in the same location that the other uh, four parasite species are found. So once you know where your patient uh, has acquired the infection, uh, it's a pretty good guess that the parasite that you're looking at is not Plasmodium vivax or Plasmodium ovale, but rather Plasmodium nolzi. And so that's how this parasite uh, became identified because of the absence of the other species of malaria and the endemic centers that are known uh, for transmission of this particular species. Now, Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating further the pathogenesis of this infection. We have a 26-year-old male truck driver from the northern tiger country of India coming into the hospital in the end of the rainy season. This is November, and he's presenting with six days of fever, chills, myalgia, small loose stools, vomiting, dyspnea, trouble breathing, dry cough, decreased urine production. He reports that he is a long-haul truck driver. He travels all over India. Uh, he reports that he lives in a mud hut when he's not working, uh, and this has a coconut leaf roof. He reports no sick context, but does report significant animal and insect exposure. He is noted to be quite febrile, um, well over 100 degrees, 39 degrees um, Celsius. Blood pressure 100 over 70. His heart rate is increased in the 120s. He's breathing rapidly in the uh, mid-20s. He appears to be in distress, and he's uh, decreased as far as his level of consciousness. Um, he is icteric. He's, he's, he has yellow um, as far as the whites of his eyes are no longer white. They are now yellow. Uh, he is jaundiced all over. He has a yellow hue. He is tender in the upper abdomen, uh, tender in the upper right part of the abdomen, and he has a tender palpable spleen. Uh, some of his labs are abnormal as well. Um, his blood urea and nitrogen normal would be 20. This is up at 102. His creatinine, an indicator of kidney function, is increased. He is anemic with a low hemoglobin of 11.7. His platelets normal would be about 200. His are down at 9,000. So 200,000 be normal. He is down at 9,000. White blood cell count is slightly elevated, 10.3, barely above normal. 75 neutrophils. 21% lymphs, 4% monos, and he has no eosinophils. He has eosinopenia. His LDH, lactate, lactate dehydrogenase, is 8,000, markedly elevated. Um, his AST, ALT, these are transaminases, transaminases from the liver. These are normal, and his bilirubin is elevated. Now let's discuss clinical disease a little bit, and this is kind of peppered throughout this talk, um, but my perspective. As far as clinical disease, the most pronounced clinical manifestation of adult onset malaria are chills and fever. These can be accompanied with frontal headache, fatigue, abdominal discomfort, and myalgia. But, but in general, any febrile illness in a malaria endemic area can be malaria, can present with a really wide range um, of presentations. Uh, fever may present for several days before you get this typical periodicity that people like to um, describe. So if a person comes in, fevers several times a day or every day, that may still be early on in disease. Uh, periodicity is, um, and, the, and the terminology here is a little bit um, challenging, I think, because of this goes back to Hippocrates and how he liked to count, but it can be daily or quotidian fever. 
Um, and as mentioned, early disease in all species will start off that way. Um, it could be after 48 hours or on the third day. Um, that's tertian. And we see that with um, some of the species pluses, such as falciparum, vivax ovale. Or it can be after 72 hours, so on the fourth day, um, that would be quartan. Um, so we see that with uh, plasmodium malariae. Now, the classic pattern of clinical disease consists of these paroxysms of chills, um, fevers reaching as high as 41 degrees C, and then lasting for six hours. I've always been impressed that the six hours is actually, um, seems to be something we see on a regular basis. And then this is followed by sweating and, and the temperature um, comes back down. Now, the symptoms of malaria have a bit of a delay from the time that uh, one is um, bitten by the infected mosquito, and they often appear 10 to 15 days after the bite. Um, although in some cases, there's been delays of several months. What we're not seeing is symptoms within a day or two of the exposure, but we are seeing symptoms sometimes out even farther. The farther out um, would be something that we see more with vivax than the other um, types of malaria. Now, patients undergoing chemoprophylaxis, so they're taking medicines to reduce their risk when they go to an endemic area, they may also have delay um, in developing symptoms till after they stop taking the medications. Now, all forms of untreated malaria tend to become chronic, including those without a hypnozoite stage. Now, I know Dr. Depami has talked about this. Um, the hypnozoite stage is this dormant stage where the, um, the malaria parasites are sitting dormant in a liver stage. And then for Vivax ovale, they can, they can relapse from there. Um, but there's also the, the ability to have low level infection, to have recrudescence. So with all malaria, you can potentially have a um, chronicity. Now infection with the Cortan parasite, right? This is Plasmodium malariae. That can persist all the way out to uh, 30 years or more. So that, that is quite an outlier at the extreme. Uh, now, plasmodium bivax and ovale uh, pre preferentially invade reticulocytes. These are the young red cells. So you're, in general, only going to see about 2% parasitemia because only about 2% of the cells of the red cells will be reticulocytes and thus vulnerable. Um, now, malaria tends to invade the older erythrocytes again because there are only a couple percent that are in that stage. You're going to have a lower level. But falciparum can attack erythrocytes of all stages, thus permitting very high levels of parasitemia. Now, what about clinical disease resistance? And this is something, um, even those outside of medicine and parasitology might be familiar with. There have been genetic changes that have been actually driven by, um, the, by the exposure um, of, our, of our species to malaria. Sickle cell trait uh, actually gives people certain advantages um, the heterozygous state is really the, um, the ideal where you have resistance, but um, you lack some of the um, disadvantages that a person with both sickle cell genes might have. There's also um, enzymes as far as glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase or G6PD, which might become deficient, giving us a certain protection. And some of the other um, say, red cell um, genetic changes, such as beta thalassemia, which we see in the Mediterranean area quite a bit in Africa, um, and ovocytosis, um, ovalocytosis, um, this last one being more common in Southeast Asia. These are um, often ways that our species have actually adapted under this pressure. There's also blood type determinants, the Duffy blood type determinant, um, and this is associated with a receptor for P. Vivax. It's probably not it self being the, the actual receptor, but there's been selection here, and the selection has reduced um, the susceptibility of West Africans for certain um, types of malaria. And then, and this is probably the most common way that people become resistant to uh, clinical disease, and this is after a repeated long exposure, you can develop uh, what is called premunition. And this doesn't last for your life, but while you stay in an, in an endemic area and can are repeatedly exposed, you can develop a resistance to severe um, disease. You still may get periodic bouts of, um, of actually feeling quite ill. Um, but, and this is critical, when you move away, even one year and definitely by two year, even though you may 
think of yourself as being from that area, your blood has lost um, that memory, that premonition, and returning to that area can be high risk for those visiting friends, relatives returning to their home places. Now, clinical signs and symptoms, as we discussed, critical is the fever, paroxysms of shaking chills. Eventually, a classic fever pattern might develop, but initially it's going to be continuous fever or even daily fevers. Um, the symptoms are going to have uh, something to do with um, localization, and it's actually quite characteristic to have destruction of red cells with the associated um, jaundice, yellowing of the eyes, and the enlarged spleen. Dixon has gone through many of these um, life cycles with you, and the life cycles do impact our clinical manifestations. And the hypnozoite, and just to remind people back, this is going to be critical in, we, uh, in our understanding of how we treat and the risk of relapses. The Vivax and Ovalley actually can have a hypnozoite stage. So when we're thinking about curing somebody, treating someone for their infection, we need to think about the presence or absence of this and how we might modify our therapy to target that. This um, talks a little bit here and is a wonderful um, graph showing us um, the timing. And it's really this um, critical early period of life when we're seeing most of the deaths due to malaria, when we, um, we're we losing our protection from our maternal immunoglobulins. We really haven't started to develop specific or um, nonspecific um, protection against the malaria exposure. Now, what about diagnosis? Now, classically, thick and thin blood smears um, have been the approach. And this has been over a century that um, definitive diagnosis of malaria has depended upon smearing the blood out, doing a um, usually a gim sustain, and looking for the parasites in the blood. The advantages here of this approach is that one, you can make the diagnosis, but also, particularly on the thin smear, uh, you can identify what species of malaria, and this can allow you to guide therapy. Um, there is a sensitivity issue here. So when you're highly suspicious with blood smears, we actually recommend repeating these at six hour intervals. There's also um, the growing use of antibody-based rapid diagnostic tests. These are simple, they're specific. You don't need a highly trained microscopist. They, they're very um, user-friendly and they're gonna allow one to detect all the plasmodium species and then allow a species level discrimination. There are molecular tests, um, both PCR and isothermic amplification. So these can actually be moved out into the field. And there's even mutation specific PCR that can guide us with regard to um, resistance to certain um, drugs. These are gonna be more used in sort of surveys of areas trying to decide what, um, what are important um, antiparasitics to be using to treat our patients in those areas. And here is a um, nice picture of someone making a blood smear. And they, they take a little bit of time to do blood smear. So there is a little bit of, um, of impact to that with regard to treatment initiation. This is a nice um, picture that uh, shows how you might, what, what you might see in the peripheral smear. You're not gonna see all of the different um, forms in the peripheral smear. Certain ones will be detected and these can help you um, identify which subspecies. Moving on to Plasmodium vivax, again, you're gonna have certain characteristics that your microscopist will, will help um, you with as far as knowing which. Are you seeing infected red blood cells that are larger? Are you seeing ones that are smaller? Larger ones are gonna be making you think of the vivax and ovale, the um, Older senile red blood cells will be smaller, so you're thinking think about malaria. So again, all the different features that you went through um, earlier on in the, in the lecture with um, Dixon, all those different forms are going to be things that are going to help you in deciding what subspecies and what treatment is appropriate. Very similar, right, to, uh, to Vivax when we look at the ovale. Plasmodium malariae, these are going to be... Um, not the enlarged red blood cells as we saw with Vivax and Ovalley. You're not gonna see the Schufner's dots, just sort of point those out for everybody there. And this is a nice new drawing that's been added to our collection. Um, Plasmodium nalesi can be a little challenging because it can look like 
um, plasmodium malariae, sometimes having these band forms, but you end up having much higher parasitemia because like falciparum, it can infect um, many stages of red blood cells. Now, what about treatment of malaria? It's gonna depend on several factors. Um, type of malaria, the knowledge of the regional resistance, the severity of the illness, um, in large part determining whether or not we can use oral versus intravenous, um, but also the age of the patient. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about the distribution of the different types of malaria, where our patient has been and what malaria they're at risk for. The default is to treat for Plasmodium falciparum initially and then adjust um, if we have more information. And we do need to be thinking about drug-resistant malaria. The biggest impact has been our loss of quinine as a treatment due to the growing in drug resistance, um, particularly to quinine throughout the world. Um, you can see a few areas where we still have a little bit of quinine-sensitive um, malaria left in the world, but it, it tends looks like it's shrinking away. Um, the modes of action, um, I won't go much into detail here, but the modes of action are gonna be the basis by which we're developing resistance um, or the parasite is developing resistance to our um, modalities of treatment. There's a number of um, agents here, but let's actually go a little bit past um, how these work and talk about how we're gonna treat them. Um, now, artemisin is changing a lot of things. And unfortunately, as we're gonna find out, as wonderful as a medication as this is, we have a bit of an issue. There isn't an unplentiful, unlimited supply of artemisin because it is something where we're growing it. So you end up limited to one crop a year. So let's go, let's hit now treatment in a little more focus. So the two main factors we wanna be thinking about are the type of malaria, the species, and resistance issues. And the second is how severe is the illness? Are we gonna be looking at oral or intravenous options? So how do we, how do we gauge severity of malaria? Um, it's pretty simple. They either have uncomplicated malaria or they have severe malaria. Severe malaria is anything on this list. Any feature moves it from uncomplicated to severe. So impact on consciousness, the inability to sit or stand, convulsions, acidosis, uh, hypoglycemia, that's specific cut-ups for the level of sugar, anemia, um, having the amount of red cells below a certain level, uh, renal impairment, the kidneys are starting to fail, jaundice, we're starting to have a rise in bilirubin levels, uh, pulmonary edema, this is the lung starting to fill with fluid, significant bleeding, shock, or in P. falciparum parasitemia, greater than 10%. Uh, some people use 8% as a lower cutoff. Now, if it's uncomplicated, having none of these features, and they're from a chloroquine-sensitive area, very easy. Chloroquine, one gram, and then you sort of follow this regimen where you drop down to 500 milligrams at six hours, 24, and 48. Children are gonna have a weight-based um, adjustment, but same schedule. Um, hydroxychloroquine uh, is similarly another option in this context. Now, what about chloroquine resistant? And this is where we get to the rest of the world, all the areas outside of that light green that we looked at before. Um, this is where in general, we move to artemisin um, combination therapies. Um, that is considered the most effective, the quickest clearance of uh, parasites from the blood. We also have other options. We have the etovacuine proguanol. We can use a quinine plus a second agent such as doxycycline, tetracycline, or clindamycin. And there's also um, the option of treating with mefloquine. Um, in general, if somebody's been on a certain prophylaxis, we would use a medicine that they were not taking as part of their prophylaxis should they fail and get malaria. But what about complicated malaria? This is uh, the one I think that um, concerns of clinicians. Complicated malaria has a certain mortality even uh, with the best treatment, even um, with the best facilities. Now throughout the world, the artemisin derivatives, artesanate IV is the preferred approach. Um, this is given IV initially, um, later on second, second drugs might be applied. In the United States, um, artemisin um, IV is only um, something that can be gotten through the CDC in certain um, circumstances. So in the US often it's gonna be a quinidine gluconate um, IV infusion in the um, intensive care unit, 
um, with uh, cardiac monitoring for the cardiac impacts, impacts of this. It's not clear that the mortality is increased by using one over the other. We, we do have a number of studies that suggest that that might be the case and that mortality and parasite clearance is better with the um, artemisinin derivatives, but the current state in the U.S. is that we do not have um, access unless you go directly to the CDC and have um, certain criteria that might allow them to release it from one of our regional control centers. Um, you always want to use a second agent as well, the doxycycline or clindamycin, um, so that you're not just treating with the initial therapy, but you're always adding the second agent. Um, and what about those hypnozoites, which we brought up a few times? If you don't treat those, none of these other medicines we've talked about are really going to treat the hypnozoite, and we're limited. Primaquin is the only um, available agent right now that can actually clear the hypnozoites. It's important to use it at the right dose. Um, this is adult dosing, so using about 30 milligrams of the base, um, two tablets um, every day for two weeks. There was another medicine that was um, briefly introduced, but there were mortalities, mortality issues. People died, so that was um, pulled back off. So we're, we're limited in our options for treating hypnozoites, for clearing that. And what about treatment beyond antimalarials? Now, this is important. We focus on treating the malaria, but the whole patient needs to be considered. Um, hypoglycemia, low levels of glucose, can frequently occur when we're treating acute malaria. So you want to be monitoring glucose levels frequently and supplementing that as needed. Um, a significant percent of people with acute malaria will develop secondary bacterial sepsis. So often broad spectrum antibiotics are introduced to cover that. Um, volume status is critical and it's a balance because as mentioned, we can have pulmonary edema if you give too many um, fluids you can actually exacerbate that but you don't give enough and you can further compromise the um, kidney function uh, constant monitoring of cognitive status um, someone who is not clear cannot protect their airway and you can end up with complications there and you want to make sure your therapy is working so we we recommend daily paracetamia levels repeating those blood smears and showing that your patient is um, is improving and respiratory status um, critical um, that this be monitored and if people require supportive care, um, having them in the right setting to support them through the acute phase. Now what about our patient? The initial um, blood smear showed 25% parasitemia and it was a mixed falciparum bivax infection. The patient was initially started on IV artesanate and then doxycycline was later added as a second drug. Uh, the patient improved um, rather impressively with the drop to 1% parasitemia by about 24 hours. Uh, the patient did well. Uh, I would like to explain how chloroquine works because it relates back to the uh, biology of the organism. And it's a very interesting story in that if the plasmodium falciparum organism needs to detoxify its environment after it's taken a a portion of hemoglobin and split off the globin port and derive the amino acids from it for its own um, uh, metabolic needs, it discards the heme by this uh, heme oxygenase enzyme that I described earlier. And, uh, or the, we'll call it the stacking enzyme for, for, for conveniences. Chloroquine blocks the action of the stacking enzyme and prevents heme from polymerizing. It, if it remains as a singlet molecule, then it's able to uh, toxically affect the biochemistry of the organism. That's simply put, that's the way it turns out. The resistant forms of malaria have the ability to export chloroquine faster than it can accumulate. And so therefore, it keeps the heme oxygenase molecule free to stack up the free hemes into this hemozoan molecule that's eventually discarded at the final act of reproduction of the organism inside the red cell. So today we have the parent drug of quinine. Of course, it's still available. And in fact, fortunes were made <clears throat> in various places throughout the world, uh, accumulating large amounts of quinine uh, for use uh, in, let's say, the military, and in um, people who were moving from a non-malarious area to a malarious area, uh, the British Empire, of course, was founded on the use of quinine. And think about where all the uh, 
portions of the world that Britain used to uh, call part of their empire. Uh, we can begin with uh, the places in India. And uh, there are lots of malaria. Wherever the British seem to have colonized, they seem to have located in uh, high malaria areas. And so quinine became their first line of defense. Uh, and in fact, um, if we look at companies that were founded on the synthesis of quinine or the extraction of quinine from natural sources, uh, those companies uh, have evolved into the Wellcome Trust in Britain and the Burroughs Wellcome Company in the United States part of the same parent company, and they both made their fortunes um, purifying and selling quinine. Chloroquine was the derivative from quinine, and you can see some chemical similarities between these two molecules here. And again, this is now an outdated molecule because of its uh, restricted use throughout the world. Newer derivatives include uh, drugs like mefloquine, shown here, and it's also used in um, preventing the clinical symptoms of malaria from developing uh, with regards to travel of people who go into malaria areas in order to observe wildlife, for instance, or uh, for limited lengths of time. They take this drug prior to leaving and during their stay and then when they come back a little bit. And uh, this uh, dampens the ability of the organism to cause clinical disease. It doesn't prevent infection, however. The drugs of choice today now include a combination of atovaquam and proguanol. If you combine these two drugs together, they're very effective in um, reducing the clinical horizon of what would ordinarily be a very serious infection to a mild or perhaps not even perceived infection on the part of the patient. There are some other drugs, too, that have uh, seen their way into uh, the pharmacopoeia of um, the anti-malarial um, physician, uh, treating patients for the disease with a, another plant-derived material called artemisinin. And in fact, uh, in 2015, the uh, Chinese woman responsible for uh, popularizing this as an anti-malarial um, shared the Nobel Prize with uh, two other people for her work. Since Artemisinin has been used to treat malaria, however. We have currently detected uh, resistant strains from this drug, and it's only been in use for the last 10 years. So you can see that ma malaria is a moving target that drug companies have to constantly uh, monitor and alter their approaches uh, to produce uh, anti-malarials that uh, interfere with sites uh, that perhaps are shared by all species of malaria rather than just specific ones. The disadvantage of deriving drugs from crops, of course, relates to the fact that once you've harvested that crop, in this case, uh, the plant that produces artemisia, uh, artemisia uh, you have to wait till next year <laughs> in order to get more drug. Um, and indeed, it has been over-harvested. Uh, an approach to this would, of course, be to... Um, grow these plants in a greenhouse, for instance, and that's that's also being done now to it as well, in places where the drug still works. So finally, we arrive at a prevention and control strategies for limiting malaria. <clears throat> I must say that uh, in the 1960s, when we were riding the crest of, I guess, a sort of an infectious disease arrogance, uh, the best way to put that, because uh, the Surgeon General did declare at one point uh, in the early 60s that infectious diseases had been conquered. Uh, within the next 10 years, they would simply not exist any longer because of the robust uh, collection of drugs that we had against them. Uh, of course, this individual was not aware of or did not mention the fact that evolution occurs in the presence or in the absence of human activity. And in this case, human activity resulted in the um, the induction of a selection of resistant organisms that required additional uh, chemotherapeutic agents to be produced. So today we find ourselves in a, in a conundrum of um, malarial drugs that work only in certain places throughout the world. And that's not a satisfactory uh, way of approaching the control of this infection. Uh, we would like to have drugs that work everywhere. That's no longer the case, however. So one approach is to limit the amount of uh, vector 
species. They're not often mosquitoes, although they breed in water. They have to invade houses in order to uh, catch the unsuspecting human asleep. And so Anopheline mosquitoes primarily bite during the evening and late into the evening hours. And so by spraying the insides of houses with residual DDT, so that after the mosquito bites the individual, they're so laden with blood that they have to rest on the windowsill before they fly out into the open. When they rest on that windowsill, they absorb enough DDT to kill them. And that's a very effective strategy indeed. However, in many places, because of the overuse of this insecticide, for other reasons, particularly to control agricultural pests, DDT no longer works because the insects, as the parasites became resistant to drugs, the insects became resistant to the insecticides by the same uh, evolutionary process of random mutation selecting for resistant mutants. So, in general, it's recommended that if we were to um, prevent the, the acquisition of clinical malaria, we would limit that uh, recommendation to people who travel from non-malarious areas to malaria areas. The risk of acquiring malaria, of course, depends on where you go and, and what you do when you get there, of course. Uh, if you enjoy midnight uh, strolls along a river or a lake and you happen to be in a malaria transmission zone, then I'm afraid you're going to have to give up that activity or suffer the consequences. The highest risk uh, for acquiring malaria <clears throat> comes during the rainy season, but not during the rainy season, just after the rainy season, when all the water is distributed, when the puddles now fill up, when the mosquitoes come out of hiding, they lay their eggs, and cycles of mosquitoes can build rapidly because, as I mentioned earlier in part one, the malarial uh, vector only lives for about two weeks. <clears throat> if you travel to malaria areas and it's during the dry season, your risk of acquiring malaria is greatly reduced. And of course, personal protection measures against mosquitoes biting is an important uh, strategy for avoiding malaria. <clears throat> Use of DEET and a variety of sprays is available uh, in most places throughout the world. Sleeping under mosquito nets that are impregnated with insecticides has proven effective in endemic areas where people live every day in a malaria area. How do they avoid that on a yearly basis? You can't just keep spraying yourself with DEET all the time and expect to survive uh, uh, the ravages of malaria. Whereas if you sleep under carefully constructed, uh, well uh, impregnated uh, bed nets. Uh, the rate of malaria in some areas has been reduced by 50% simply by this method. Antimalarial drugs, as I mentioned, don't prevent infection, but they do prevent disease. So we have prophylaxis, we have short term and long term treatment programs, we have self-treatment programs, but I don't highly recommend them because people that treat themselves usually don't read the fine instructions on the inside of the box, but it's amazing how many places throughout the world sell anti-malarial drugs over the counter, and you don't need a prescription in order to acquire those drugs because the infections are so devastating that no matter uh, what uh, form of chemotherapy you uh, institute, it's better than none at all. But unfortunately, uh, in those areas where people are actually self-medicating, uh, the rate of uh, resistance to many of these uh, anti-malarials is very high. Multiple drug resistance is a problem which has recently emerged in Southeast Asia, in Thailand, Cambodia, and is increasing in, South, in East Africa as well. And uh, because of that, in these cases, none of these drugs work. So the only uh, strategy is avoidance. And speaking of avoidance, here's the way to do it. This is a WHO-approved uh, configuration for, for sleeping with a bed net uh, so that there's enough room inside this tent, this resistant tent, so to speak, that children and, and parents can both sleep inside without touching the sides of the net. Because if you do that, 
Uh, some mosquitoes may be good enough to attack, feed, and leave without getting killed by the insecticide in the net itself. So uh, these are designed so that you can sleep in the middle of this without touching the sides of it. What's lying ahead for malaria in terms of control or treatments uh, is anybody's guess. Um, the research community is heavily funded in this, in the United States at least, and throughout England and in other countries that have uh, active malaria control programs uh, that can afford them, of course. Uh, unfortunately, most of the countries that have the malaria can, can't afford to do the research needed in order to uh, work out strategies for control and, and limiting the infections. So vaccines, although it's enticing to realize that one of the antigens has already been identified, namely this circumsporozoite antigen, and the proof of that was obtained by X-radiating uh, sporozoites. It uh, attenuated them, but allowed them to still infect a host. Those animals were completely protected from a, a natural infection if they had first been exposed to these uh, irradiated, attenuated sporozoites. So we know that the antigens that these parasites uh, present to the host are protective inducing. Uh, but no vaccines yet, no effective vaccines based on that finding have been evolved uh, as, uh, as of 2017 at least. New and better drugs are always needed. There's no question about this. Side effects, toxicity, use in children, safety for pregnant women, one dose, multiple doses, all of these issues have to be addressed in making drugs more accessible, cheaper, and uh, more universal in terms of their effects. This is a big subject, and we haven't taken as much time as we could to describe all of the details of the way malaria impacts humans. Uh, but we can learn more about this if we were to read, for instance, this uh, wonderful review article that I've listed here for your reading pleasure, uh, or uh, <clears throat> you can listen to a number of episodes of TWIP um, in which we have interviewed uh, people doing research in malaria. We've reviewed lots of interesting um, nuance with regards to the molecular biology of this parasite. We've interviewed people like Tony James, for instance, who's trying to alter mosquitoes so that they uh, can be infected uh, but that they don't transmit the infection to another person because um, of some genetic alteration. And it's recently been observed that uh, if uh, adult Anopheline mosquitoes acquire Wolbachia, for instance, they are unable to transmit malaria. So attempts have been made now to introduce Wolbachia into wild populations of uh, Anopheles uh, to see what would happen if we could do that. You can find uh, TWIP on microbe.tv slash TWIP uh, for your listening pleasure. So uh, I've enjoyed presenting these thumbnail sketches of malaria to you. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Next time, we'll discuss another apicomplexin, Cryptosporidium parvum. 